Welcome to Linden New Art series of Meet the Artist sessions. My name is Juliette Hansen and I'm the curator here at Linden New Art. Our Meet the Artist series introduces our audiences to current exhibiting artists at Linden New Art. And tonight we're talking to Nicholas Folland about his show Burn Down the House. You're joining us live on Facebook and YouTube and there'll be lots of opportunities to ask questions. So if you'd like to ask a question or make a comment about the conversation, please type those into the chat or Q&A sections. Our events and community engagement coordinator, Linda Studina, Linda Studina will be monitoring the chat and she'll be adding those um, so that they can be addressed during the question time towards the end. Before we get started, uh, please let me begin with an acknowledgement of country. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we're all virtually meeting this evening. Um, I'm joining you from Linden New Art, which is on the lands of the Bunurong people of the Kulin Nation. And Nick is joining us from Adelaide on the lands of the Ghana people. I pay my respects to the elders, past, present, and emerging. And while we meet virtually this evening, tonight draws upon the ancient history of this land and reflects the millennia of experiences of First Nations people coming together to celebrate, to learn, and to connect. I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to all First Nations people who are joining us this evening. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce Nicholas Folland. Hi, Julia. Welcome, Nick. Hello there. Um, by way of an introduction, um, Nick is currently the department head for both contemporary studies and sculpture at the Adelaide Central School of Art. He recently exhibited work at the Art Gallery of New South Wales as part of the National 2019 New Australian Art. And he presented a survey exhibition of his work at the Art Gallery of South Australia in 2014. Nick's work is represented in the collections of the National Gallery of Victoria, Art Gallery of South Australia, and the Museum of Contemporary Art in Sydney, as well as numerous Australian university and regional gallery collections and private collections across the world. Nick is represented by Talano Galleries here in Melbourne. Um, thank you so much for being here. We are thrilled to have your stunning exhibition Burn Down the House at Linden currently. And I'm looking forward to finding out more about that. Um, but we're going to get started by looking at some of your previous work because a lot of the ideas really do carry through to what you've created for Linden. So I'm going to bring that PowerPoint in now. Um, so if you wouldn't mind um, telling us where these exhibitions took place and uh, some of the ideas and materials and, and processes that you used in, in bringing them into life. Yeah, well, look, this is a really early work and I just included this slide particularly for the work that's on the right hand side of the screen there, the, the yellow works. Um, this exhibition is held at Greenaway Art Gallery here in Adelaide in about I'm thinking 2000, maybe 2002, something like that. Um, one of my very, very first commercial shows with Paul here in Adelaide. Um, but I think the work on the right has a particular resonance with some of the work that's in the show at Linden. And, you know, I, it's, it certainly wasn't on my mind at the time that I was making the work for Linden, but these things tend to reoccur. So the same pink gum and blue gum branches that are in the Linden show, this yellow work here was made from very, very similar pink gum and blue gum that came from the, the same part of the Adelaide Hills here, um, except that this, the work on the right, the yellow work is kind of upholstered like furniture. So first it was wrapped in foam rubber and then it had a, a kind of sheath of vinyl stretched over it. So when I was making that work, I was thinking of furniture and the way and the materials that go into making furniture and how I might manipulate them. Um, I guess it's worth mentioning the work on the left there that is that was two armchairs that were cut kind of diagonally and, and stuck back to back, kind of trying to get some sense of a, a kind of mountainous landscape, I think, at the time. Um, so the yeah. furniture and the, the kind of branches, things from nature, and these materials around that have a kind of domestic origin have been there for a long, long time in my practice. 
Mm, and we can see some of these uh, more domestic items in the next few slides. Yeah, um, so the rest don't really run in any particular chronology. Um, and this work um, has only been shown once by Tolano. Um, and really, in some ways, this was a was a work that was a, a personal kind of challenge in, in casting the crystal bowl as a, a lead bowl. So what we're looking at is a cast of the original Stuart crystal bowl in lead with a black patina, um, and then they're kind of sat, you know, face to face like that. Um, so there is this kind of playful element in my work that's about kind of exploring materials and, and the possibility of materials as well. So some Absolutely. of the things. Kind of, yeah, and, and this work is another work that kind of sits within that vein, I guess. The the shiny contraption down the bottom is a series of uh, mid-century candlesticks um, and then it's woven copper wire that makes up the, the form that's kind of attached to it. Yeah, so we have some more images of beautiful uh, crystal wire that you, you do often, you've used in, in the past. Yeah, the mm. crystal has kind of been a recurring material that I've used um, and you know that really came about just through exploring materials and the potential for, for these materials and I have used a lot of crystals so these were some of the early boats in bottles that I produced um, and these two bottles one of them has a replica or, or an imagined replica of the boat that Matthew Flinders sailed around the, the country in mapping the country and the other one has a replica of the boat that Bourdain um, was sailing around the country mapping it for the French in the opposite direction and, and of course those two ships while they were mapping the country met here in South Australia down at what's now known as Encounter Bay um, named after the encounter that they had near Kangaroo Island um, that's mm. always kind of been curious to me so yes, that's just the detail. that's kind yes. of the best view you could get of it kind of peeping through the top and I like that the, the, the faceted crystal kind of makes them mysterious, miraculous things. A lot of the boats that I've made in bottles are actually um, boats that have vanished um, at sea. Um, ah. and so the crystal element of them being, you know, barely visible or only visible in, in kind of sections or in fleeting glimpses, I think kind of plays with that idea a little bit. Mm. And the way that you've installed some of your other works, the, the drawn glass and crystal, it's quite quite amazing. And I, I love the way the, the sort of this play of the shadow appears in this work too. Yeah, it's a bit dramatic with this one, isn't it? Yeah. Um, this is mostly I use, I try to use found objects wherever I can, but this is some glass work. And it was the first time I'd had someone blow some glass for me. And, and I worked with the, the amazing artist, Tom Moore, here in Adelaide um, and he blew these forms for me um, and then I, I learned to cold work them in the uh, cold shop here at the jam factory in Adelaide to cut them to look like crystal. Um, they don't function in the way that laboratory glass would function of course um, but I was trying to just get some connection between the, the, the laboratory glass and the, the kind of mystery around the sciences that exists in my own perception of it and that really kind of domestic crystal um that, that i love so much so trying to draw yeah. this together yeah that's a detail and using detail. the laboratory clamps and things to to reinforce that notion of the science mm. where was this work this shown? was uh shown this particular image is from uh ryan renshaw gallery when they were operating in brisbane um, I think they've recently opened a new gallery called the Renshaws, but I haven't been to Brisbane, of course, for a little while. Um, but I showed with Brisbane, with um, Ryan Renshaw Gallery for quite a number of years until they closed down. Um, and I made qu quite a number of these works, uh, and they are purely um, crystal, antique crystal vases um, that are screwed onto the wall. And then I made up that little light fitting that just shines mm. a, quite a bright light into the heart of the the vase to get that refraction on the wall. So a very, mm. very simple gesture, but quite beautiful. Um, yes, absolutely. Quite a, quite a nice thing to kind of explore too. It kind of gave me another sense of how these crystal forms operate and what their patterns actually do. Yeah, um, another gorgeous way you've used some crystal too is with this um, chandelier, which I, I believe has uh, an ice component as well. So again, an amazing combination of materials. How did this work? Where was this shown? 
Well, this this is actually this particular image is from the Contemporary Arts Centre of South Australia that used to exist here in South Australia. Unfortunately, it's one of the many organisations that we've lost in recent years. Um, beautiful gallery that was in an old um, Federation home here in the, the kind of mm. inner suburb of Parkside. Um, but this was a work I made after I'd spent a year or so living in Rotterdam. Um, studying at the Pizza Art Institute and you know I, I have to admit I liked warm weather and Rotterdam yeah. was freezing <laughs> and I'd been reading stories about um, exploration as I as I traveled and a lot of stories of kind of polar exploration or, or you know people who travel and explore the extremes um, and I decided that when I got back from from this particular time overseas that I wanted to begin to make some things with ice. I wanted to try to find some ways to make ice grow. Um, and this was the first, really the, one of the first explorations of, of making ice. And so on the ground there, it's just a very basic refrigeration unit um, that's piped up to the chandelier uh, and it grows ice around the chandelier. This work is currently hanging in the NGV. Actually, it's just recently been rehung. Um, before the opening of the triennial. So it's really nice that it's back on show. And it was one of the few things that I managed to see while I was over there in Victoria installing the, the show at Linden before I had to, of course, leap on a flight out. Oh, this yes, is another, very suddenly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So this is another similar kind of work. There are a number of these in existence, and this is the one that's in the MCA collection. Um, mm. That's not up on the I'm working with chandeliers. It works so well in, um, you know, similar uh, spaces to Linden that are those heritage buildings. Yeah, um, I, I love really showing it to the past. I, I love that. I love galleries that have all of those those kind of hints towards a, a kind of history there. I guess that's something that I look for in my practice. It's one of the reasons I really like using secondhand objects is because they come so imbued with with a, a kind of history and a, and a previous function, and particularly things like the chandeliers. Um, mm. They were things, I mean, I didn't grow up with chandeliers in my home. I grew up in a very kind of mid-century home. Um, but in South Australia, there were a lot of kind of Southern European people who moved into South Australia during the 40s and 50s in particular, late 50s, 60s. Um, and so we had a lot of homes with shag pile carpets and chandeliers and all of these things that, that totally fascinated me because they were a complete contrast to the home that I grew up in. But of course, these things have, you know, became very unfashionable and out of popular uh, and, and unpopular. Um, in the, through the 90s and you know probably before that and so there were things that I, I began to kind of collect I, I've got about 20 or 30 chandeliers still in storage at the moment um, mm -hmm. but there's something I think there's some kind of appeal in these things as kitsch as they are and they've kind of become focus pieces in modern homes in very minimal modern homes and they're much harder to get again and the value of them has increased considerably um, so it's mm. interesting how that fashion kind of moves backwards and forwards with these kinds of objects. Oh, yes. I think the crystal we're... also has that nice connection to, to nature as well, I think. You know, something like a chandelier that has those drops of crystal that are like water. You know, there's something about ice and water and, and the chandeliers, but also that the fact that a chandelier is kind of that reference to water. But there's also the candle flame. You know, a chandelier doesn't have any bulb. It has a, a candle. Um, so there's that nice kind of thing going on between fire and water as well in the chandeliers. Oh, yes. Yeah. So what was this exhibition? Um, it looks like this, we're going back to a book. Yeah, this is at the Experimental Art Foundation, and I can't remember when this was exactly. Um, it's fairly early in my career too. I really included these couple of shots because it was the very first time I'd used crystal was for this exhibition. And this was at the Experimental Art Foundation, which is also no longer exists in South Australia. It's now become Ace Open, which is a very, very different kind of gallery to what the Experimental Art Foundation used to do. Um, in the background, those blue images are maps of, one's a map of the Indian Ocean and one's a map of the Pacific Ocean, <coughs> largest areas mm -hmm. in both of those oceans with no inhabitable land mass. So they're pretty much blank. Yeah. See, but and this, this is time, inside the boat. Yeah, so this was the, when I first started to collect crystal. It was actually when I was living in Sydney, so it must have been about 2006 when I was studying at Sydney College of the Arts, um, and I was asked to, to do this work for Adelaide, for the gallery in Adelaide. Um, and collected this crystal. And the first time I'd worked with crystal like this and the first time I'd kind of lit it from below as well, which has become something that I've, I've done quite a lot of, trying to get a sense that the, the boat was kind of full of, of water 
as well. Ah, I see. And we're moving on to another um, amazing crystal installation that you did. Yeah, so this was uh, at the Anne and Gordon Samstag Museum. Um, beautiful Pat Patricia Piccinini works here as well. Um, and this was the first time I'd made one of these suspended landscapes that I've made quite a few of now as well. Mm, I think we have another one here. Yeah, and this was quite a, a wonderful, a great experience actually, because in my studio I'd, I'd set up a small piece of grid so I could test whether I could suspend the crystal. And I'd worked out that I could do it, but there was no way I could install this entire thing in advance. So I kind of collected the crystal, mapped it out, um, and then we went, in, went into the gallery and installed it and just us installed it. It took about two weeks. I can hang about 100 pieces of crystal a day on average. Um, oh the other thing that happened was that when I first looked at this site, the floor in the gallery had a matte finish. Um, but mm. the week before I installed, they polished the floor because the cleaners had real trouble getting the matte finish to, to clean properly. And so after I'd installed it, I ended up with this most fantastic reflection um that was really really nice and really kind of worked with the, that floating sense of this island um, ah, it's just stunning absolutely stunning um i have more shots here in a completely different space yeah so this um, is 2012 for the adelaide bnl curated by uh, alexi glass um mm. and this is in uh the elder wing which was the kind of colonial wing of the Art Gallery of South Australia that I've always loved very, very much. It's a, a very odd, when I was a kid, it was a very dark kind of space with lots of, you know, famous dead men um, looking down at you with serious frowns and um, early colonial landscape paintings, but also a lot of paintings that either looked onto the shore from the ocean or out to the ocean from onshore. I find that there's a kind of interesting psychology in that. And my own family came to South Australia, my ancestors, just before proclamation. So very, very early on in the in the um, in the development of South Australia under Wakefield's plan. And they kept very, very good diaries. So they talk about you know, the, looking out for land when when they realise they're beginning to get close to land, that that constant search on the horizon for land, and and the excitement when they finally found land, but um, not in their diaries, but in other diaries I've read from uh, the early settlers in South Australia, they talk a lot about getting here and it not being the paradise they were promised. You know, under Wakefield's plan, Adelaide was meant to be this paradise where. Um, the people that were coming across from England would settle completely peacefully with the indigenous people, not invade their lands in any way whatsoever or disturb their culture. Unfortunately, of course, that was fraught. It was absolutely an impossible thing to do because the land was completely occupied. So there was a lot of you know, conflict happened immediately, although it was a really beautiful romantic plan, it was doomed to failure. So a lot of people got to, to South Australia and actually realized the colony was a disaster. Um, and you know, this, this great, vision of, of this paradise and developing this wonderful uh, community here just wasn't working. You know, the people were drunks and muddy and it was just a filthy place. So a lot of people just immediately write in their diaries about wanting to go home again, which was really essentially an impossible thing for a lot of people. So that thing of looking to shore from the ocean and the excitement of that, but then getting there, getting here, realising you were stuck, you know, I, I can imagine those same people then sitting on the shore, looking out to the sea and just, you know, dreaming of home. Um, yeah. So that this particular part of this gallery seemed like a place where something that was kind of slippery and miraculous needed to exist, and that, that's why I installed this work here. Oh, absolutely. Um, it's interesting because the idea of home does, I mean, it certainly carries through into the exhibition we have here at Linden. Um, but again, with, with this installation, it's kind of exploring the um, the domestic and how comfortable or, or indeed anxious you might be within domestic spaces. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's always, nearly always, though, this this hook back to landscape. And it's a little bit less in the Linden show, actually. Um, it doesn't come across through in all my works. But this work here, for example, that was called Raft. And for me, it, it is a it's a it's a model of a raft, you know, or a bathroom that becomes a raft. The white wall becomes a sail. Um, and it, it gushes water, you know, every every tap 
the, the shower, the system, the toilet, the bath, everything is overflowing with water at, at kind of high power. And then there's a very mournful piece of music by Grieg that plays over the, the background of this. Um, I don't know, were we able in the end to get the video of this working, do you know? Oh, no, I, I think it's unfortunately not. Yeah. Um, um, sorry but, about that. No, no, that's fine. You can see in these details, you can see the way the water was rushing uh, through this. So the bathroom was built inside of a pond. I built a pond inside of the gallery first. And this was also at the Experimental Art Foundation, um, also shown at one stage at Canberra Contemporary Artworks. Um, so it's a very loud kind of exhibition, but the music, the piece of Grieg's music, which I'm going to forget exactly what it was called, really has these beautiful highs and lows. It's very mournful. So there are moments mm -hmm. where the the music is quite overpowering, um, but then it drops right down and the rush of the water kind of comes into play. Um, but it also playing on our, our anxieties a little bit. You know, I, I talk quite a lot uh, in the past about, you know, the things we bring into our homes. And here we've got a, a timber toilet seat, for example, but we have running water, we have, you know, fire or heating, we have all of these elements, laminix, fake kind of stone bench tops, these kinds of things where we bring nature into our home. But we also suffer a certain amount of anxiety. I'm sure we've all left the home at some stage and had that sudden feeling that we might have left the tap running or we might have left the oven on or these kinds of things. So we have a certain amount of anxiety and the anxiety is essentially about kind of, in a way, nature taking over again, nature defeating this control that we have. So in a way, that's kind of embedded in this work as well. Yeah, um, the next work we're going to have a look at is um, it's called Dancing with, with Darwin. And I believe we do have a video to accompany this one. Yeah. Shall we have a look at that? So, um, video is just a little bit jumpy. So this, this is a, a, a lot of recent works over the last decade or so have been animated in one way or another. Um, and this was a work, uh, a lot of these larger installations, I, I see them as, as theatre without actors. Um, I actually trained initially, uh, my, my plan was to become a theatre designer. I've worked a lot in theatre over the years. Um, but I'm a bit of a control freak and theatre, I found that I just had to constantly be making compromises for actors, for directors, for all of these different kinds of things that staging requires. Um, whereas in the visual arts, I could achieve lots of the same things um, without any of those kinds of burdens. This was also presented at the Samstag Museum a few years ago here in Adelaide. Um, so just trying to get the furniture to kind of take on a, a very, very subtle life. The chairs tilt back to a point where they're just about to tip over before they then slowly come back um, into position, but quite subtle, quite slow and quite subtle in the space. Okay, I'm going to return to your PowerPoint there and we can see some more images of this work. Yeah, I guess the other thing, you know, that's worth mentioning about this work, like with a lot of my work, is that while it is furniture, there's been an active effort to kind of destroy its function. Um, mm. You know, there are no seat tops. It's been completely stripped back. It becomes, you know, in a way it becomes that natural thing again. It's stripped right back to the timber, um, with the exception of one little strip of laminex on the back of one of the chairs. Um, but that function is is always kind of defeated in my work wherever I can. Yes, I think it... And a lot of furnishings. Yes, I think you've mentioned in the past that, um, you know, it's, it's a good outcome if people go home and kind of reassess the, the use or the function of the things that they're surrounded with in those spaces after yeah. seeing your work. I really like that aspect to it. Well, the, the um, first family work that we looked at, the, the title of that is I Think I Was Asleep. And a lot of my the titles around that time were, were titles about, you know, the, the potential for something to be happening in your absence or, or something that you're not aware of. Mm. Um, you know, perhaps hinting towards that idea that your furniture might have some kind of life when you close the door. Yes. This is another amazing uh, interior. Um, and I think we do have a... A video of this work as well. Yeah, let's just look a little bit at that. Mm. So this was installed at the end of 2019 uh, at Adelaide Central School of Art here where I work. Um, 
and it's a full sta scale kitchen. It was presented very theatrically. It's it's very much a, a kind of staged work. I built a, a, a kind of stage uh, an, a, a, within this space. All of the walls, the furniture, a lot of the cupboards and things like that all move very slowly within this space as well. You just saw the cupboard slam there. So some of the things slowly come open and then slam shut. But all of these things are just slowly animated. Um, the surfaces were all printed with a like a potato print um, that took yes. a long, long time. Luckily, one of the advantages of working in an art school is lots of volunteers who are really keen to spend some time working on things with you. So I did um, um, take advantage of, of the students and it was great fun, actually. We had all of these walls and the floors and everything laid out in the studios. Lots of uh, potatoes and pumpkins just printing away at this, these patterns repeatedly. You can see the tap running also on the right hand side there as well. So there's this kind of mm. constant activity going on in, these, in this work. Yes, the patterning really adds such an intensity to the space, doesn't it? It does, yeah. And mm. the volume's quite quiet the way we're watching it now, but in the space it really felt like it was being ripped apart. and. And, you know, a lot of people commented on how anxious the installation made them feel, particularly because the walls, you can't see it quite so much in these images, but the walls really did flex a lot backwards and forwards and, and in and out. Wow. Well, I mean, it's just incredible work. Thank you so much for um, sharing with us some of the things that you've, you've been up to up until now. I think it might be a, a, a good point to maybe move into talking about uh, the amazing exhibition that we, we have here at Linden at the moment, um, Burn Down the House. Um, maybe we can start with the title, because I have to say, when you, when you first told me about the title, Burn Down the House, I found it quite funny, given that we are in this um, heritage building that used to be a family home. Um, what, what, what's the meaning of, of that uh, phrase for you? Yeah, well, I think as a notion, this, this notion of burning down the house, it's something that's been with me for a long time. It was something that a friend used to talk about quite a bit. And, and, and she'd talk about it kind of when she was feeling uptight as, 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 a, as a way of expressing some kind of total release or some kind of total escape from something. But I think it, it's, some, it's a term that we can, we can kind of consider on lots of different levels. And it began to kind of resonate with me a little bit more when we went into the COVID lockdown. Um, and suddenly we're kind of dealing with, things like surfaces around me you know in those early in the early part of the lockdown in particular and, and of course all of you in Victoria experienced this much more than we did here um, but you know that paranoia about surfaces all around you and this idea that you you know you had a house full of cleaning stuff and you cleaned your surfaces regularly you know it wasn't just that you cleaned your hands when you came home didn't touch anything you you know there was kind of this idea that you had to constantly be cleaning surfaces and things like that. This kind of cleansing. Um, and I'd read at different times in the past about burning as a way of, of cleansing things. You know, I, I remember reading somewhere about camps, and it might have been even concentration camps or something like that, of them dragging all the beds out, all the iron beds out, and, and setting and burning them, putting them into fire to, to rid them of, of kind of things like fleas and, and that kind of thing. So burning, burning is a kind of cleansing, but it is also a way of you know kind of clearing a zone for a new beginning and, and of course we've seen that in in farming practices but but also you know in all sorts of practices where fire has a way of kind of totally destroying things and giving you that opportunity to so then completely rebuild from scratch and there's something i kind of liked about that but it also came up and, and we've talked a little bit about this you know talking heads have that song burning down the house and they talk about that you know, not as a physical kind of burning down the house, but as an opportunity for a radical change, um, you know, in time mm. and place and in attitude. I think you, like um, you sent me an amazing quote uh, from, uh, from Talking Heads, David Byrne, saying that, um, you know, burn down the house is um, a metaphor for destroying something that's entrapped you as an expression of liberation to break free of whatever was holding you back. Yeah. It's very powerful. Yeah, and, and you know, even, even on top of that, reading their interviews, they, they also talk about going to early parliament gigs 
which I wish I could have done myself, but um, the, the audience apparently before Parliament um, would come on stage would scream, burn down the house. It was kind of a chant that they would sing. Um, and, you know, for sure it had political connotations within the black movement early, you know, we're talking kind of the 70s. Um, so mm. I thought that was really, really interesting too as, as a notion that kind of has that history, and particularly at a time when these issues are, are becoming very, very prominent again in the last year. So I guess that's, you know, with the Black Lives Matter and all of those things around, around those notions too that we, we really try and deal with at the moment seem to just have a resonance. I don't know that my work lives up to the power of these kinds of notions, but it just seemed like sort of like something that, that kind of created a window, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and this, um, yeah, the, I think the idea that the, the home became something very different for us all last year, something that um, was once maybe a comforting place, but became somewhere that we would really felt trapped by and, and the need to, to escape from. Yeah, very, very much. Mm. I wanted to ask you as well about the um, the materials that uh, you've used in in your work in this show. I know we've touched on on that, looking at some of your past work, because the material materiality of your work is so important, and everything that you use um, it carries this um, a lot of layered meanings because of either a particular substance, like for example wood in this exhibition, or because of the history and function of the object itself. Um, maybe you could tell us a little bit more about the the objects and materials that you've chosen to use in this show and, and, and what the meaning is behind them. Yeah, so we've, we've kind of got a couple of things happening here. We have this furniture that we're looking at now that, that is all furniture that's that's all been sourced secondhand um, over the years, some of it. Actually, the, the, the table here that we're looking at, that large table, was my kitchen table when I lived in Sydney. So that's been with me for a long, long time. Um, and that tends to happen with a lot of my, my work. They're things I, I live with or things I have around me or, you know, things I, I buy because I think they have potential. Um, actually, several of the bits of furniture there have been in my home at different times. But there's something I really like about that old kind of almost archaic furniture now that is very, very unfashionable, you know, the, the kind of brown furniture that I'm sure will have its day again. Um, but it, particularly in a world where that we, you know, people seem to decorate their homes regularly and, and I just look around my neighbourhood and, and, you know, I've lived here for about 12 years and there are houses that have been renovated three times in those, those in that amount of time. It just blows me away, the amount of kind of wastage there is. But this, this furniture, I've stripped it right back. So it's, again, none of this functions. You can see there's no tabletop, there's no drawers in the cabinets, there's no seats on the seats, that kind of thing, kind of destroying its function. And then also presenting it in a kind of precarious way where it's, you know, could collapse at any moment too. So it, it kind of sits, hopefully it ceases to become function functional in terms of its practical use and begins to function as something that has that potential to make sound. I mean, the bottle caps too, we've talked about the lager phones in the past. And I think lager phones, it's, they've been on my mind for a while, but again, once I started to be locked down, there was kind of a desire to make noise. You know, I had times in the early months in particular where I just wanted to scream sometimes. You just want to do something really loud, some kind of expression and not so people could hear but this this desire to kind of get something out of the system um and i began to look at, at you know things that made sound and the lager phone as a kind of a make do instrument you know it's basically just a stick with bottle caps nailed to it you know that we see in a lot of folk bands so it's very much that kind of home crafted thing that i'm also very very fascinated in the way that people make do um so it mm. kind of there are a number of levels that that interested me on. My initial plan was to use all found bottle caps, all secondhand bottle caps, but of course with the lockdown, suddenly there weren't so many people drinking at pubs, and that became a little bit more difficult. Um, <laughs> but anyway, I'm not so worried by that because I think that there's a much more jewel-like quality in the, in the new caps and the way they were applied in the end. Yes, um, and very much that link between the the furniture and then the branches in the second room. Um, it brings brings about that, that uh, contrast between nature and the domestic again that you were talking about before. And you've really said that 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 tension between those two things, between our homes and the natural world, um, is often really at play in in a lot of the the work that you make. I'm going to share the PowerPoint if you can have some more detail. 
of these these amazing works that and, and some of the detail of the bottle caps um mm -hmm. so it's sort of like both the branches and the furniture have been stripped down um into these more, more kind of refined or sort of almost decorative items themselves you know, so that they're, they're at once linked but in contrast with each other at the same time yeah well they, this work in particular you know removing all of the the kind of branchy parts of it so it just became a very linear curved linear kind of thing still branch like but but possibly you know I, I don't know how other people respond to it but, but but I guess I hope a little bit that you might have to think for a second to be sure that it's a branch the other thing I should mention about this if you're looking at those caps a lot of people might not recognize those caps because one of the things that I also discovered when I started looking for caps and when I couldn't get them from local pubs I discovered there's a massive global trade in bottle caps <laughs> um, and it was actually cheaper for me to import 10 kilos of bottle caps from the United wow. States than to buy brand new bottle caps here in Australia. It My just goodness. totally blew me away. And um, unfortunately, I couldn't find anywhere in Australia where I could buy enough bottle caps. So I <laughs> ended up importing a lot from the US just to try and get the ones that I wanted. Um, yes. Also, I also imported some from Europe as well, just to try and mix it up a little bit. Um, and there are Australian caps there as well, but majority of them are Bud, Budweiser caps. <laughs> Something I've never drunk, and I'm not a big drinker either, no, to be honest. <laughs> um, I wonder if we can talk about this work. It's the, it's the largest and perhaps most complex installation piece in the show. It's called House Party. Am I right in thinking that there are about 7,000 bottle caps in this work? There are, yes, yes. I mean, are. that's that's phenomenal. Um, a lot of people have asked us about this work. Is it, how have you made the furniture sit in that way? Is it all attached or is it, uh, <laughs> is it yeah, carefully? No, it's not attached at all. It's, not, it's <laughs> a very, quite precariously, uh, all, all the pieces are leaning against other pieces there. Um, it's, it really bit, could fall down. It, it really does have the potential to fall down. Yes, yes. And I do hope that when you walk into this space, you have some anxiety about that too. I mean, there's that, that word anxiety. Anxiety is something I kind of, I do try to generate in a lot of my work. Um, I guess part of that is also because the work doesn't actually make a noise, but it has that potential to make noise. Um, mm. And so I was interested in, in how well that sense of sound might be expressed through the installation of this work, that it didn't need to make noise, that it could actually just be in such a state that as an audience, when you're moving around it, you have an anxiety about kind of almost breathing too heavily that the thing might begin to collapse and make an absolutely tremendous noise. And yes, you really do get a sense of that. Because um, I mean, I think for lots of people, it would bring to mind that, you know, the idea of the lagophone because of the bottle caps, um, but yeah. then the, the potential for noise and the, the anxiety caused by the, the potential for it all to collapse is it's palpable in that space. Um, but there is there isn't a, a superb sound work um, included in the exhibition as well. And I wonder actually if we can um, have a, a quick uh, look at a video of that, of that work. Oh, it's tapping out a nice little beat there. It's, it doesn't always hit such nice rhythm. So this is, is a work called, <laughs> um, just called uh, SO. And uh, there are two little contraptions like this. There is one that just taps out these three little taps for each rotation. And the second little motor taps out uh, two sets of three quicker taps. The, there's kind of a few things happening here. It, it also, like all of these works made through COVID time, there is this kind of slight little COVID thing that's a little bit like the screaming that I mentioned before, that desire to scream. This is more a kind of tapping on the wall, you know, trying to kind of, um, you know, like trying to get some response from the up, from the other side, in a way. Um, and I do remember as a kid, once waking up early in the morning, and, and I grew up with three brothers. We all had rooms, and some of the rooms backed onto one another. And I remember once hearing this tapping on the wall when I woke up, and I made a few little taps back, and it tapped back, 
And I really couldn't work out what was going on. And actually, it was my brother in the other room who was just randomly tapping on the wall, not to me, but it kind of became this thing. Um, but so there's, there's kind of this signalling as if it's kind of signalling. Um, I also live in a house now where I share a wall with, with someone else and we, we kind of share sounds through that wall. We're very aware of each other's lifestyles. But um, the S and the O, so um, I, I'm going to mix it up now, but in Morse code, I think S is three quick taps and O is three long taps. I might have got that backwards. So in a way, it's also tapping out a kind of SOS. Um, but there's also something nice in, in you know, just that, that term so, you know, that kind of a term that's really about, it's really a pause, you know. There's not, so is, is, is a word that's used as much to kind of fill a gap as to actually express something. Um, mm. so yeah. This... Something that fills a gap. And, and it is a space between the two other galleries as well, a right. kind of, almost a no man's land between the two main galleries. So it kind of became a fun way to play with that as well. Yes, and it starts automatically as you move into that space, that's, that's the, the tapping starts. Um, it really encapsulates a lot of the, the things that we've been talking about in relation to this exhibition, the kind of the anxiety, a sort of a need to escape and this sort of sense of um, maybe a fear or questioning of the of the domestic realm as you move through these these spaces i really i really love it um i'm wondering at this point if uh, linda do we have any questions coming in from from people who are watching i have many more questions but um, i'm just wondering if anybody um has typed anything in there Ah, so for me, there's a strong sense of the fragility of the human condition in your work. Is this your intention? Um, yeah, yeah. Look, it is, actually. Um, I guess it's worth, I, th I think, I'm, I'm certainly trying to provide something that, that can give you a way of recalling that, that kind of fragility. And a lot of the work, you know, I mentioned before that my, my family came out here um, before proclamation in, in, in the very, very early days of settlement here in South Australia. And one of the things that motivated them to come to South Australia that was that one of their family, a cousin, was with the British Navy and he'd been stationed in uh, New South Wales and he'd gone missing at sea. And at that time when ships went missing, they were referred to as being overdue because it was very, very easy for a ship to, you know, just um, have to pull in somewhere to do repairs or something like that and then have to wait a full year before it could get the, the winds that were right or the currents were right or things like that. So boats were all, ships, unless they were found, they were always just overdue. And my ancestors thought that they were going to be able to come out here and possibly find this, this Charles French Rob Robbins who'd gone missing. Um, he'd actually gone missing somewhere in the Pacific. He was on his way to South America um, with the British Navy and, um, you know, he was never going to be found. But a lot of my works kind of reson uh, kind of work a little bit off of those kinds of narratives, which is why I'm interested in these narratives of exploration and, and the narratives of, of narratives of exploration that I'm most interested in are the ones that are disastrous. You know, I, I always find they're the most interesting. So Scott's journey to the South Pole is, is absolutely one of my favourite, favourite narratives. You know, there's so much excitement and, and trauma. You know, we all know that the lines about, you know, um, I'm just stepping out, I might be some time. You know, it's, it's a classic line of, of someone basically giving their life to save the others. But of course, they never, they never actually lived in the end either. They got, I think, within about 50 miles of where the next food supplies were and a blizzard came in and they knew they weren't going to be able to escape that blizzard. But in addition to them knowing that they weren't going to be able to escape the blizzard, they apparently travelled with poison that they could take so that they could take their own lives quite peacefully. But they decided that actually um, they were going to allow the, the blizzard to kill them basically, which is incredibly kind of beautiful and romantic, the idea that you battle the elements for months and months and months on end and then in the end, you know, realise that they're going to win. So kind of giving over to that um, I think is really, really interesting. And I think these things say a lot about the human condition and I think the reason that a lot of these stories, even Burke and Wills, you know, another tragic story of exploration, I think the reason they're such appealing stories is because they do talk about our desire to achieve things but you know, our potential failure within that. Um, there's all sorts of interesting stuff there. So, yeah, you know, I do think about human fragility a lot 
and a lot of my works actually refer much more closely to to failure and to, and to death possibly than than they do to success in that way mm, that's but one I, thing I, I i was kind of wondering nick about about the exhibition that um you know we've mentioned anxiety and i think um you know contemporary society does give us so much to worry about in fact and your exhibition, um, in some ways, with the title of it, it's um, it's a call to action, maybe to get rid of outdated thinking or systems mm. that might be holding us back. So I was wondering, in fact, if you're if you see your practice as being fundamentally optimistic, or are you often trying to provide a kind of a warning that um, things might all fall down, as it were? Yeah, that's a really good question. I, I think it sits maybe somewhere in the middle there because, you know, I, I, I'm i conscious that a lot of the time I make things that are beautiful things, you know, which which has kind of been unfashionable in a way. I think it's, it's becoming fashionable again. Um, but I think certainly in the time that I've been practising in the last 20 years, beauty hasn't been a thing that, that people focused on a lot. But I use it in a Partly I use it as a, as a strategy because I know that we're attracted to beauty. There's no escaping that. And I, in, so I kind of use it as a way of getting an audience to spend a moment with my work, you know, to actually hold them there for a little while. And particularly using objects that, that people might know from their own history. So with the crystal works, for example, you know, it's really lovely when I see people around those works with their, you know, with their family and kind of pointing to particular bits of crystal that they might recognise that their grandparents had or that they have at home and, and those kinds of connections that, that exist there in, in our own histories. Um, so... I don't know. It's necessarily optimistic, though. I think I think I try to generate something that will be seductive, um, but maybe if you spend a little bit of time with it, it might reveal something that's a little bit more disturbing, or something that exists under the surface, or has the potential to fracture that kind of desire. Uh, I'm not sure why that is, though, Juliet. Yes. No, but it certainly does. It's all of those things all at once. Um, Linda, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the time as well. Do we, do we have any more questions coming in? Not at the moment. I'm wondering, Nick, if you um, could maybe tell us what, what you've got coming up next. What are you working on at the moment? Yeah, I've got a few things coming up in the next few months. Um, the next exhibition will be uh, at Ridock Gallery in Mount Gambia. Um, and that's a representation of the kitchen scene that we were looking at before. Um, I'll be installing that in one of their galleries down there, um, although it's quite a different gallery, so I'm having to adapt that work quite a bit to make it fit in that gallery. Um, so that's coming up in late May, I think. Um, I'll then be a little bit later in the year going across to Perth for the inaugural Oceanic Craft Biennale, um, which I'm quite excited about. Um, the very different kind of uh, event for me to be involved with but uh, I think that'll be quite an interesting one um, and I'm not really sure exactly what I'll be doing for that one yet and then I'll have some work uh, a little bit later in the year uh, at Canberra Glassworks uh, for an exhibition there that I'm still not completely sure what that work will be at this point in time so there, there can uh, be things coming up over the next few months yeah I'm looking at looking forward to finding out more about them as they appear um it's been so wonderful chatting to you Nick you've, you've just brought up such important topics and um, we're, we just couldn't be happier with your exhibition here at Linden it looks absolutely fantastic um, thank you thank you so much for, for showing us your past work and for letting us find out more about um, about the current show at Linden here yeah, um, I'm, great pleasure it's, it's been great and great questions too thank you for that Super. Um, I might just let everybody know before we go that we've got two more Meet the Artist events coming up soon with Ash Keating and Troy Emery. And if you go to our website, lindenarts.org, you can book in for those and find out more about what we have on show here. Um, otherwise, thank you everybody for being here tonight. And thank you once again, Nick. Uh, such a pleasure to talk to you. Thanks, Juliet. And thanks to all of your team. It's been terrific. Thank you.